and welcome to Bits to Billions, the unicorn story. We are in conversation with Mayank Kumar, the co-founder and managing director of Upgrad, which is targeted mostly at working professionals. It helps them upskill and get a leg up. Mayank, it's good to be in Mumbai, right in the middle of monsoons. It's rainy, it's windy. Which way is the wind blowing for Upgrad? Because if I look at the ed education technology space, there's a lot of storm ahead. Uh, a lot of storm already underway in terms of layoffs and cutbacks. Which way is the wind blowing for you? It's all the tailwind right now, Tanja. Uh, no, but thank no you headwinds. For, uh, no headwinds right now for us. But I think uh, the good part is that uh, the ecosystem is maturing and we are seeing a lot of newer things emerging and specifically in the working professional, college learner, higher education ecosystem, things are looking far more interesting than perhaps what it was a year or two years back. Right. But in terms of growth, a lot of the other edtechs we saw, they've suffered post-pandemic with things moving yeah. offline. Yeah. How has it been for you? No, so I think for a lot of K-12 through ecosystem and let's say test prep ecosystem, yes, the, because of pandemic coming in, offline shut down. So a lot of demand went to sort of the online ecosystem and now with offline opening up, some demand is bound to go back and therefore each of the edtech ecosystem providers where there's an offline alternative, they're thinking of ways and means in which they can venture into that domain, but it will have a short term impact. But I do believe that in the long run, uh, given what happened during pandemic and how the shift happened, you will see a significant move happening and online adoption will increase going forward because now people have experienced it. One, education is a funny business, more people experience it, more people will come there. Founded in 2015, Upgrad is one of India's education technology unicorns founded and run by Ronnie Skruwala, Mayank Kumar and Falgun Kumpali. Targeted at the 18 to 60 age group, Upgrad is a higher education and upskilling startup that offers accredited courses and certificates in relevant industries such as e-commerce, big data and BFSI. It competes with the likes of Eruditis, Baiju's owned Great Learning, Simply Learn, Udemy and Coursera, among others. Its offerings cover various segments such as test prep, study abroad programs and undergrad degrees to campus courses in 250 universities. It was last valued at a reported 2.25 billion after raising 225 million. It wants to be in the full value chain of college learners and working professionals. Mayang, the other thing that I've also noticed among um, other edtechs, you know, mainly in the test prep space, be it your Baiju's, Vedantu, An Academy, um, they've all pivoted to offline. Uh, you know, edtech started with this value proposition that it's going to be online, it's really going to redefine the paradigm. But if you look at it now, we are it's almost as if we are back to square one. So, will Upgrad change its model in any way? Do you see, see a need to change your model? You're in a very different space, the higher education and upskilling space. But will you also have to make changes to adjust to the new normal, to adjust to the offline world? So I think there's difference in the in the models that some of the other edtech providers are playing in because at least in their segment there's an offline alternative and therefore for them to capture the demand they do need to have a presence in offline because there is a customer preference for offline they need to be there there's a customer preference for online they need to be there so I guess for those sectors specifically K through 12 test prep uh, tuitions and and sort of tut tutoring centers. I do see a need for a lot of edtech companies to go towards offline because there's a market sitting there hmm. where they can leverage technology and improve the efficacy, etc. That's something that they will definitely work on. Uh, but when it comes to, let's say, working professional college learners, because there's not that much of an offline alternative, online is the only option for most individuals to study and learn. Hmm. And therefore, for us, while we will be present offline, but that will largely be for acquisitions, counselling, uh, being closer to the customer and not necessarily for teaching. Right. The other thing that I want to ask you Mayank is your value proposition is targeted at working professionals who want to upskill themselves in uh, you know uh, courses that are relevant to their particular industry. In fact 75% of your business comes from there and 25% are perhaps 
uh, people who want to pursue online degrees. But now with you know the job market looking a little bleak, uh, at least when it comes to startups, yep. we've seen over 13,000 people being laid off. Do you still think people will invest in upskilling now working professionals or will they be more careful with the money they spend? Sure. Will they be more cautious? How is it going to affect the dynamic for you? So the interesting statistics that education is counter cyclical to the economic sort of growth. So whenever the economy goes down, the higher education, edu higher education goes up. We have up. seen this in 2008, yeah. 2009. We have seen this in 2014, 15, 16, around the time when that transition happened. So I do see that this is the time when a lot of these individuals will go back to the drawing board invest in themselves and become more relevant. And we are seeing that, I mean, given whatever is happening, we are not seeing a drop in demand. We are seeing same number of people actually more enthusiastically looking for uh, a better sort of upskilling opportunity. Uh, in fact, when I look at this ecosystem, I also believe that what's happening in startup is a very small portion of the working professional ecosystem. There's a much larger IT services, BFSI, FMCG, retail ecosystem, where people are looking at ways and means in which they can get to more new age roles hmm. and more sort of growth roles. You know, how is it working out for you? Will you also have to optimize and rationalize and you know, all these terms that yeah. companies are right using to cut, right yeah, yeah, yeah. to cut costs. Better terms for cutting costs. Yeah. No, I, there, there is, see, I would not deny that there is an environment where, yeah, funding is going to be difficult, funding is going to be tricky. Uh, so for every line of business, one has to be running it in a manner that is sustainable. We hmm. cannot run a business which every customer coming into us is loss making and that shift has to happen. Having said that, um, there are other areas in which we are growing. So while the core business is profitable and uh, will throw in cash, there are areas where we will continue to invest. Uh, so we, we venture into study abroad which is a very large part of our business. We are going to invest in that. Uh, we are looking at sort of our own branded skill certification program hmm. where we are going to invest heavily on there. Uh, we have few job guarantee, job link program. We are going to invest in these elements. So there are multiple new areas, Chandra, that we have ventured into. We will continue to invest. So we are looking at hiring for leadership roles, for various sort of operation roles and executive roles. Uh, and those are the places where we will double down and ensure that just because there is that talk of funding winter, we don't get into a place where we are not investing in future growth. That future growth is in integral to our sort of long-term journey because we're creating a lifelong learning pathway and just one line of business may not suffice for us to be a lifelong learning provider. Right. Um, I must ask you, Mayank, if I talk to entrepreneurs in B Bangalore, uh, at least in the last few weeks, you know, the mood is pretty bleak. People are talking about how everything has kind of come to a standstill and, you know, what's the mood like among founders in Mumbai? See, I guess, um, I mean, Except for the monsoon, <laughs> everything seems to be on track. But, no, but mm. I guess uh, I'm, I'm, there's no that much of difference between Bombay and uh, Bangalore. Uh, in Mumbai also, folks are now looking at making and ensuring that they are not going beyond the means at which they need to operate in. So mm. there will be that. You will definitely see a far more scrutiny in how people are hiring, far more scrutiny in what kind of resources that you're investing in. Um, a lot of um, adjacent experiments that companies we're doing will start slowing down. That will not happen. That may not happen. But if you're very clear about your strategy, then you don't think twice whether this is an experiment which is adjacent, but this is part of your strategy. So I guess those are the ways in which you will see difference. But I don't see that significant difference in Bombay and, and, and Bangalore because money has no color and money has no <laughs> destination preference. Uh, uh, but we, we definitely see things getting more saner and more rational in the, in the approach right now. What will also help Upgrad weather the current turbulence in EdTech is the experience and wisdom of its co-founder and chairperson, Ronnie Skruvala, one of India's most seasoned entrepreneurs. Skruvala built a media and entertainment conglomerate UTV that he later sold to Disney. He started Upgrad at the age of 58 with Mayank and Falgun. He's also an investor having made investments through Unilaser Ventures. Mank, what's it like working with Ronnie Skruvala? Uh, no, it is, I mean, you should ask him <laughs> yourself on yeah, that question. Yes. <laughs> but I want to ask you, no, what's it like working with no, him? No, no, look, I think... Ronnie, uh, you know, has his reputation of being a hard taskmaster, a tough person to I work with. Where does that reputation <laughs> come from? 
So now it was a hard task master, but huh. I guess um, a few things that definitely sort of you get to learn a lot is that no matter whatever thing it is, whether it is this table, this light or work or revenue or numbers, is just overly particular about everything. Hmm. And I don't know how he gets that energy, how he gets that work, huh. but for everything he wants to be extra sort of thought through and thinking it through and that's something that I'm trying to pick up but it's very difficult to pick up that straight because he has had that experience of doing it for so many so years. So when you say he's exacting, he knows every part of the business? Every part of the business, hmm. more than perhaps the business owners more, also. More than what I would, uh, what I should be yeah. uh, <laughs> knowing. That also is, is true. Also <laughs> but Ronnie and all entrepreneurs people. inherently micromanagers, I mean, I, I wouldn't call it micromanagement, but you know, you have to kind of have that attention to detail. I think there's you a misnomer that hmm. attention to detail is micromanagement. Hmm. I think that you need to know a lot more. Hmm. I'm not somebody who, if somebody asks five questions, I'll say, okay, let me open my laptop, let me figure this out. So if you're on top of it, your thinking gets a little cleaner and gets a little sharper. Hmm. I don't think that should be looked at as micromanagement. Everyone at various levels of leadership should be on top of their game, top of their business, top of the details. Hmm. And if you are, you can scan in your mind and come to better decision making process. So to me, it's not micromanaging. It helps me clean up and take harder, faster decisions. Hmm. And how have you changed as an entrepreneur? compared to the UTV days to upgrade? In many ways, actually. Uh, it's a lot more collaborative process. You know, when you're starting up something from the ground up on your own, you're an absolute first generation entrepreneur that has never been able to raise money or debt. You look at things in a very dis different way. Yeah. Uh, second, media taught me a lot of collaborative work because at the end of the day, you can only succeed in media if you're a great catalyst. Yeah. If you want to do everything there, you want to be the director, the producer, you want to be the creative person and the marketing person, it doesn't work. So I think that grounding that I got in media to be collaborative is exactly what I think is my evolution hmm. in terms of building teams. And my first instinct therefore, Mayank in his own mind was thinking of getting into education separately in a different world, I was looking at it the same way. But the very fact that I was looking for a co-founder and he was looking for a co-founder speaks the volumes of how one hmm. has emerged. Ronnie, last year, EdTech was the poster boy of the Indian startup ecosystem. Created by the media themselves, but uh, yes. Don't lay this at media's door. This year, it's kind of become the bad boy of India's startup ecosystem. Created by the media <laughs> itself. No, the data speaks for itself. I mean, more than half of the layoffs that are happening today are happening at EdTechs. So, you know, employees are asking a lot of tough questions. Customers are asking these questions that, you know, um, if these EdTechs had money, to pay to Shah Rukh Khan and Amir Khan, Amitabh Bachchan is your brand ambassador. Why were they not prepared to pay employees? You know, they hire in one shot, fire at the first sign of trouble. Yeah. Why are we not building businesses that can weather even three months of a funding winter or, you know, even six months of a funding winter? Yeah. So I think very legitimate questions. Firstly, you can't judge business and sectors just on their capacity to raise funds and not. So, and this winter, I don't identify with that because there are four seasons in life and they come and they go. That's the idea. They come and they go and there's an evolution. There is a reason why winter leads to the next season, okay? And it actually trains people in a very different way. You want that change of scenario. You learn a lot of lessons. I think winter is a lovely time to learn a lot of lessons. It separates the men from the boys and the girls from the women. It builds long-term businesses that outlast. And I think those are some of the positive points of that. Coming specifically to EdTech, yes, when you get, when you're immature or naive and you get funded heavily and then those same people sitting on your board say, you know, where's the next level of growth? Why don't we diversify? At that stage, your cue is, let's pick it up and go forward because obviously you raise more money than you needed. That's mm. the first premise. So when yeah. you raise more money than you actually needed because you were advised by the same people that take it from me because otherwise you never know when I'll close the doors, I'll continue raising my own money and do $10 billion funds, but that's what it is, then you diversify. So what you're seeing here is a correction, hmm. two corrections. One, the correction that COVID brought about in the K-12 sector, yeah. and two is diversification because of m more money with some of the companies, more than they needed, and that's the only thing you're seeing. But there is an absolute reskilling revolution that's going on, not just in India, but around the world. Hmm. That's not slowing down. 
do learners want to change their domain and vocation? Do more people realize that as a working profession now I can actually carry on learning? Otherwise you normally thought when you flung your graduation you were done with learning? Yes, that is here to stay. So the hockey stick of K-12 and the excessive funding, those two are the only things that have actually changed and thank God they've changed because you're now in a sane time, a very good time, you can build things. Hmm. Now we should not misinterpret spending on brand ambassadors as a callous thing. You need to build credibility sometimes. Credibility is built across the board by a lot of people. So when you're moving from a brick and mortar credibility to an online credibility, you need a certain sense of attachment. And different, different people have different sense of how they want to build a credible brand. Hmm. When we choose Mr. Bachchan, it was only for one aspect of our business, which is our study abroad business. Because there we were touching parents who were taking a decision and a very expensive one to send their kids abroad. And therefore we felt Mr. Bachchan represented that. So I don't think we should categorize all of this in one large lump. And the last thing I would say is, EdTech is a very different animal in K-12 and a very different animal in higher ed. Hmm. Uh, are you relieved that you perhaps did not dabble in K-12, that you took a call to be present in higher learning? I mean, because the chickens have come I, to roost, I can't be, at I least can't, for K-12. I can't be relieved because I was very clear that is something we didn't want to do that. And I think when Mang and I first came together, he was more clear than I was, that if you want to build an EdTech company around the world, hmm. then outcomes is going to be the most important thing. And ROI for your learners is going to be the most important thing. And you'll only see that in higher education. You won't see that in K-12. Do you think the tech has consumed the ed part when it comes to some of these unicorns? It should consume, right? Because hmm. you're actually now creating a very selective process hmm. of being able to aspire and go to a university, which 99 out of 100 people can't go. Hmm. And you're now catching the other 99 people and saying, look, you have an option through online. So it should be that. It should be that. It's not a bad thing. Hmm. Ronnie, you know, you've been a serial entrepreneur who's successfully built up multiple brands um, and then found a strategic buyer for them, whether it's Hangama. Once. Yeah. Once. Once. Yeah. Once. So it's not serial. I mean, I'm not continually <laughs> by. I, uh, the, the same person who bought Hangama bought UTV, <laughs> which is the Walt Disney Company, just FYI. Right. No, but I just wanted to understand what, what's the end state for a grad or the desired end state? You know, the, the best way I can answer that is the end state in media is out of the 500 people who stood outside the line in the 1990s to start media companies outside the Doordarshan when they privatized Doordarshan as a single channel, there were only four or five in 2012 left by the time I exited. So I think I, I outlasted 95% of them. And I think in education, we're building a company to outlast many others. That's the best way I can say this. Um, if there's one advice that you'd like to give startup founders today, what would it be? I think just stay the course and I think be sane about it. I think a lot of people are here in a very balanced manner. You got to build businesses and build companies. And that's what we're here for. Take your idea, take it to the next level, pre-plan and worry about the last mile. Mank, you know, we were talking about sustainable business models with Ronnie. Now, Abdrag, um, if I look at your FY21 numbers, you posted, I think, revenue of 300 crore and a loss of 200 crore. Um, how is FY22 looking for you? Have you kind of managed to contain the loss? No, so in FY22 also we'll have losses because yeah. we launched some of the newer lines of businesses. Uh, um, but the core line of business um, is sort of turning profitable and it is at a profitable level but the other lines of business we are continuing to invest in mm -hmm. so whether it is study abroad whether it is a company that we recently acquired so mm -hmm. I think those businesses will continue to be in the funding mode uh, but look we are not in an ecosystem where it's a large cash guzzling sort of business because in education you get the money up front Correct. and then you spend it later so we are quite cautious of that fact that we don't want to continue building it mm. with a, with a la large cash guzzling we want to focus on ensuring that the core business becomes profitable and perhaps certain other businesses will continue to be in the, uh, in the investment mode. But net-net, we will bring down the, uh, the lost levels within the organization such that we are able to sustain it very, very meaningfully. Right. If we look at what's happening in China, they have really cracked down yeah. on edtech companies. In fact, I think we were discussing how the, the government has said there that you know you cannot monetize yeah. uh, some of these business models. So now there's a barter system <laughs> going on. 
are you worried that this could happen in India? Because if you look at what the government said yeah. recently, they've almost sent a warning to edtechs that you know you can't run these business models. You have to take um, a customer concerns into Correct. account. So, how do you see this evolving? So, two ways I will answer. I think what happened in China was more political than regulatory, hmm. uh, and given the fact that. Uh, the ecosystem is still struggling with one child policy moving to two children policy hmm. and the cost of all these healthcare, education, real estate, yeah. everything got cracked down in that process. I think that's not the situation in India. Uh, but having said that, all the tech companies are very aware that we, there is a customer. See, education is not like buying, ordering food on, on a platform or ordering a cab on a, on a platform because in those situations, if you order a dahi chawal and you got idli dosa, you will be upset, but you will forget about it. Yeah. If you ordered a cab, instead of coming in five minutes, it came in 15 minutes, you will crib about it, but you will forget about it. In education, unfortunately, if you do something wrong, the person will crib about it and they don't forget about it. Yeah. And therefore, education comes with its own sets of, um, I, I say with great power comes great responsibility. If you do everything right, the person will also remember you for the rest of the life because you change the person's journey. So from that angle, all the edtech companies are very clear about the fact that we cannot let consumer grievances hmm. not addressed. And as part of that ecosystem, we have now formed an Indian edtech consortium where all the edtech companies, which potentially represent about 95 to 98% of the overall edtech enrollments, have come together and have targeted this grievance as one area for us to solve for. And we have formed that consortium where all the companies have signed a code of ethics. The code of ethics covers three broad elements that we need to focus on from a consumer complaint perspective that we cannot, there should not be any um, inappropriate advertising hmm. because you're dealing with learners, yeah. children, parents, students. Uh, aggressive sales practices need to be avoided and not be followed, which is what EdTech is known hmm. for, that we aggressively push for sales. Uh, and the third thing is about refunds and financing policies. So I think all three things we have looked at very carefully. So uh, on the other hand, we understand what the government has concerns about. We understand what the consumers have concerns about and therefore the consortium and the group of companies have come together and form our own disclosure and our own sort of body. It's also managed, just Chandra, to let you know, it's managed by an independent grievance review board, which is headed by an ex-Supreme yeah. Court judge. Yeah managed by five, six people from the industry and across the ecosystem. Uh, so we are proactive about it uh, uh, and we are working towards that such that 99, 99.9% .9 complaints get resolved. And if in case there is any issue, there is an independent grievance review board that will solve for it. So from that angle, we are taking care of it. The second point that I will add from, a, uh, from what we hear from the government perspective is that education in general, uh, the advertising around education is looked upon and there are a lot of complaints that come around the education complaints. But again, 95% plus of those complaints are coming from traditional education provider and mm. less than 5% is sort of coming for edtech. Uh, we do uh, understand that as an issue and therefore we are working closely with various bodies to form a mm. common code for advertising as well. Got it. Finally, Mayank, um, what will the next five years of Upgrad look like? You know, the first five years was about um, expanding your presence across segments, be it upskilling, higher education, you also spoke about a university, um, test prep for government services and so on. Yeah. Um, and you've also expanded to international markets. So you're already there in US, Middle East yeah. Um, yeah, and Southeast Asia. What will the next five years of Upgrad look like? Sure. So I'll just maybe lay out what Upgrad yeah. is today and how Upgrad has evolved. So we, while we started with working professional, if you look at today as a lifelong learning puzzle, uh, if you're an 18 year old, if you want an online degree, your first degree, you can come to Upgrad and we can provide you the right degree. If you're currently studying in universities and colleges and if you're looking for upskilling programs, we have programs available for you. If you graduate and you want to go abroad, we have a study abroad vertical. Uh, once you have graduated, if you want a private job, we have some job guarantee programs. If you want government job, we have yeah. a government test prep. Yeah. And once you're working, you want certificate diploma degrees, whether it is from universities or our own branded program, Upgrad is there. And as enterprise solutions also, we go to companies and offer our program solutions. So what we want to do, Chandra, is that we want to own the lifelong learning play. Uh, and our objective is that every year when you start the annual planning you put across this amount of money for vacation, this much for insurance, this much for healthcare, this much for wellness. 
but there is no line for an individual today on education. We want to be that line and we want to own that line that look if everybody should commit a certain amount to invest in themselves to make themselves more skilled and more upskilled. And that is the thematic that we are working towards, but that is at a macro level, but coming to very specific uh, there are three priority areas for us at this point of time. The number one priority area for us is we want to double down on India. We, India is a core market and that market we want to double down. We do see there is a larger opportunity. Uh, it may not happen just with one model, so it may require a multitude of models for us to go deep in the Indian market. The second approach for us is um, looking at US very strategically. Falgun, my other co-founder has now shifted to the US. Uh, we had to push him uh, to <laughs> go to the US and settle down there. Uh, so he's working on some interesting innovative stuff in higher education, working with universities, launching their programs globally, internationally and in the US. Uh, so in the US we will focus on identifying various approaches in which we can establish a meaningful presence and that one area where Falgun will be dedicatedly working on. And the third one for us is outside the US we do see opportunities where we can leverage the model that we have created in India and, and launch there. Whether we do it via m as whether we do it via organic, both options we are keeping it open. But the goal is expand our presence internationally and establish a very strong lifelong learning play where learners can come back to us and I should be able to tell if Chandra came to study with me for one program, I know that five years later she will have another need and she will again come back to me because I have the right sort of understanding of what her needs are, how our learning environment is and can provide the right sort of solution for her to move up in her career. Assam or Mumbai? Assam. IIT or ISB? IIT. The best advice you got from Ronnie's crew up? Focus on execution and nothing else matters. Your mantra as an entrepreneur? Put yourself in an uncomfortable position. VC or founder? Founder. The most important course that people can aspire for upskill? How to unlearn things. Your favorite upgrad course? Data science. If not a founder, what would you do? Cricket. On that note, thank you very much for talking to us on this debate. Thanks, thanks, Anja.